Okay, so it's a pleasure to, recommend, uh, to, to welcome our next speaker, Stephen Griffiths from Leeds, and he'll give a talk on the strange instability of the equatorial Kelvin wave. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Phil. Um, and thank you, Phil and Chris, uh, for being brave enough to invite a fluid dynamicist to, uh, to this uh, event. And um, this is uh, part of a collaboration with uh, Josh Shelton, who's sitting at the back, or he was sitting at the back. I think he's disappeared, actually, for some reason. Um, and Phil and uh, John Chapman as well. So um, this is going to be uh, the order in which I'll uh, talk today. So I'm going to start off with a bit of generic background about where this problem originates. And, and the, the, um, the origin is, is fluid dynamics. It's geophysical fluid dynamics. I'm going to talk at the first, just quite generally about some different systems in geophysical fluid dynamics that, uh, that have the, um, the properties um, or are likely to have the properties that I'm going to go into in great detail um, later on in the talk. Um, so that's just a bit of background physical stuff. Um, I'll, I'll then talk about one of these three systems more closely, which is um, a system in equatorial fluid dynamics and how there's a, an instability that uh, uh, originates for a particular wave mode in that system. And in that second part, I'll, uh, I'll be showing you uh, numerical results um, and considering the limit of a small shear parameter. And what we're going to find is that the growth rate of this instability is proportional to the exponential of minus 1 over epsilon squared as epsilon goes to 0. Um, and um, there's some interest in these numerical results because they're, they're solving um, ODE eigenvalue problems um, over sort of a large domain, and you need very high precision numerics to, 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 to find these uh, instabilities. So I'll be showing you growth rates of 10 to the minus 20 or so. And then part three, I'll delve into the asymptotics of this system. And broadly speaking, what we're going to be looking at is an ODE eigenvalue problem, which, when unperturbed, is essentially a parabolic cylinder equation. Um, and then it's going to be perturbed in various ways um, by this small parameter epsilon representing a shear flow. And we're going to derive this um, growth rate um, scaling plus the factors. And it's going to be using a fairly simple method um, all, all along the real axis in the direction uh, I I across the flow. And Josh's talk, uh, which is this afternoon, is going to give a, another view on the same problem in the complex plane. And again, just for um, um, sort of uh, to orient, orient you, the first five um, or maybe ten minutes are going to be an epsilon-free zone. Okay, it's all going to be sort of physical considerations to tell you about the problem. And then about here, approximately here, it's going to be all epsilons and no physics whatsoever. Okay, so there's going to be quite a shift um, as we go through the talk. So if you don't like the physics, you can wait for the epsilons. And that's that. And at the outset, it's also worth noting there are, there are connections with quite a lot of work that's been ongoing. So in particular, this, this, this study, you might say it's the culmination of a series of papers um, involving John Boyd, uh, which started in 1981 when he uh, published a paper on thermal uval eigenvalue problems with an interior pole. So he'd been messing around with this equatorial fluid system in the late 70s, actually. Um, and considering properties of the waves in it. Um, and uh, there were four studies, um, the last of which is the most relevant, which is the numerical study um, um, showing this beyond all orders instability. There's also uh, links with some other papers in the fluid dynamics literature. There's, 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 quite poss there's probably a lot more links than these two here, but these are a couple I've found um, which are to do with so-called critical layer instabilities, um, again, for shear flows. So in, in terms of the, the sort of the general opening background, I'm just going to give you three um, different physical configurations um, in which the sort of behavior I'm going to talk about may manifest itself. So the first of which is a very simple 2D setting. Um, so there's a, a vertical Z and a horizontal X, and there's a shear flow, um, which is a function of the vertical height. And this is going to be a density stratified fluid. So gravity is pointing down. And there's some buoyancy frequency which measures um, um, the frequency of oscillations in this system at rest. And if you take the equations of fluid dynamics, linearize them about the basic flow, and look for disturbances of this form, 
so they've got a wave number k in the x direction and there's some vertical structure function, then they satisfy this famous um, Taylor-Goldstein equation. And this is the kind of thing that people like me um, spend a lot of time looking at, ODE eigenvalue problems. And it's an eigenvalue problem for, 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 the, for C, which is the phase speed of the wave. And typically, you're, you're applying some boundary conditions that the, um, the structure vanishes at some boundaries, or it just decays as you go to plus and minus infinity. Um, so it's an eigenvalue problem for this phase speed C, and we're particularly interested in if the phase speed C has an imaginary or a positive imaginary part, because that corresponds to an instability in a growing mode. Okay, so that's um, um, system one, and, and, I'm, and I'm showing you this just to show you um, the structure of the ODEs that we might be interested in. And they all typically have a factor of U minus C in the denominator somewhere, and that's going to be important later on. So in, 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 this, in this system, the simplest possible um, configuration you might have is just taking a density jump at z equals zero and also a jump in the flow velocity at z equals zero. Um, and that's a case you can solve exactly because the, um, the differential equation um, simplifies um, just a, a second derivative minus k squared times w is zero. Um, so that gives you solutions that are exponentially decaying away from the interface on the scale of the wave number k. Um, and then you can match them across the interface and derive the, um, the phase speed c. So in the case of no flow, these are simply gravity waves that are trapped around the interface and decay exponentially away. Um, and if you stick in flow, then you find that the flow can destabilize those gravity waves, provided the flow is sufficiently strong. And this is the famous um, Kelvin-Helmholtz instability from the 1880s. Okay, so this is what the um, stability picture would look like as a function of the flow parameter u. There'd be stability, and then there'd be a critical point where um, the modes become unstable. So that's system one. That's all very well known, right? As is system two, actually, which is even uh, more well known. So this is simply now shear flow again in a horizontal xy plane. So there's no gravity in this system. And this, again, if you look for disturbances, so x is the along flow direction, y is cross flow. And if you look for these same type of disturbances with wave number k and phase speed c, you then get the Rayleigh equation is even more famous than the Taylor-Goldstein equation I showed you a minute ago. Um, and possibly the simplest solution you can have in this system is to take a velocity profile that looks like this. It's constant, and then it becomes linear. So you can think of there being an interface between these two regions. And in this system, there's a, there's a, a delta function in the vorticity gradient at this interface that supports a trapped wave. You might call it a trapped vorticity wave, although it's gen generally referred to as a trapped Rossby wave. And again, there are solutions that decay, like e to the minus k way, ky, away from this interface. Okay, so in a simple setting, um, when you take a simple flow, you get uh, exponentially decaying waves away from a structure. Um, if you want something a little bit more complicated, you can take the same sort of flow profile, but um, join it up like this. Constant flow down here, a region of constant shear, and then another region of constant flow. So they get, you can think of there being interfaces around these um, jump uh, delta functions in the vorticity gradient. So this is a, a shear layer of width 2b. And this problem was solved by Rayleigh in 1880. I'm showing you a lot of classic literature here. Um, and he derived this expression for um, the phase speed C. I and mean, this is a really classic paper in the history of um, hydrodynamic stability. Um, and if you pl and uh, the, the upshot of this is that there's a, a finite range of wave numbers leading to instability. So that's negative values of C squared. And then the flow stabilizes beyond that. And this instability can actually be interpreted as a um, an interaction between one wave on this interface and another wave on this interface. Um, but because these waves are, have got this exponentially decaying structure away from the interface, um, the interaction and the instability becomes very weak as the wave number becomes large. 
So that's system two. System three is actually the one I'm going to talk about today. So this um, combines features of system one and system two in that we're going to have a shear flow in the x direction um, with shear in the horizontal y direction, but there's also going to be a z direction um, in which there's going to be gravity and there will be a density stratification as well and, and rotation. I haven't had any background rotation so far. So this is the sort of the full geophysical fluid dynamic system, three-dimensional rotating and stratified. And without wanting to get really into the details, there's a, there's a horizontal momentum equation um, in, in the x and y directions, and then you can combine the density and the pressure. Um, it's going to be hydrostatic um, and incompressibility into a, a, another equation for the pressure, and this is assuming that the disturbances are sinusoidal in height. Um, Again, we don't need to get into the details. The, the key point is there's a system of equations in U, V, which are the horizontal flow, and P pressure. And you can study this in, in various settings. And, and one setting you can study it in is near the equator. And to do that, you have to specify an appropriate value for this Coriolis parameter F um, near the equator. So if you take the equator to be at Y equals zero, um, the appropriate choice is F equals V to Y, which means at the equator, the flow doesn't feel any rotation, and as you move away from the equator, the flow does feel the rotation. And if you combine those three equations that I just showed you into a single ODE, this is the one you get. Um, it's a bit more complicated than you might like, but it's just the one um, that comes out. So in here, you have the, the velocity U, or derivatives of the velocity U in various places. You've got the wave number K, You've got this uh, V to Y term, which is to do with the rotation. You've got this N over M term, which is just a constant to do with the stratification in the system. And throughout, you have this omega tilde term, which is a omega minus KY term. So you've got these um, one over omega minus KY terms in your denominators, which are analogous to the one over U minus Cs in the Rayleigh system. So it's a fairly complicated ODE. Um, in the case of no flow, it simplifies massively to a parabolic cylinder equation. Um, and if you look for disturbances confined to the equator, um, then you get various kinds of equatorial waves. And all of these decay um, exponentially away from the equator. There's an e to the minus y squared over two term in an appropriate non-dimensional coordinate y. So again, you have waves that are trapped near a, a feature, which in this case is the equator. Um, I mean, that's the, the simple case, which has been studied since about 1966 or so. This was first derived. Um, and when you stick flow in, it becomes horrendously complicated, and you, you, you resort to numerical simulations in general, and they show all sorts of human instabilities. Um, and the relevant point here is that some of these can be interpreted as resonances of these waves, these trapped waves. So... Um, this is the end of this uh, first part, and, and just what I want to stress is that we're, we, or I, am interested in um, instabilities of, of shear flows. So these are linear instability problems, and potentially in a wide range of settings with different configurations of rotation, stratification, shear, and so on. Um, for all of them, you end up with an ODE that you need to solve. It's usually a second-order ODE. Um, with some boundary conditions, typically that the disturbance vanishes as you go to plus and minus infinity. And this is a, an eigenvalue problem for a, a, a complex phase speed C, and if C has an imaginary part, you have an instability, which is generally an interesting thing. Um, in all of the systems I've shown you, it, when you have no flow, there are waves that decay exponentially away from some structure. So it could be a jump in the density, it could be one of these vorticity um, delta functions, or it could just be something like the equator, which gives some structure to the flow. Um, and and this, this, is, this is really key to, to what's going to happen later in the talk, that you have a wave in the system that decays exponentially, and that's what's going to give us these beyond all orders terms in the phase speed. Um, yeah, and, 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 and these instabilities, they can often be interpreted um, as some sort of interaction between these waves, these trapped waves, um, and, the, and the background flow. Okay, so that was part one. So part two, um, this is the transition from the physics to the epsilon. So um, 
we're going to return to that um, equatorial system. So either these set of three PDEs um, or with this particular assumed structure, this, this big ODE. And we're going to make one additional assumption is that the shear flow is going to be the simplest possible shear flow, which means that the velocity just increases uh, linearly in Y. So it's just a flow with constant shear. <coughs> and after an appropriate non-dimensionalization, which, again, we don't really need to get into, um, these are the, the governing equations in U and V, which are the horizontal flows, and P, which is the pressure. So D here um, just denotes a, a, a derivative with respect to Y. That'll be the case throughout the talk. So Y is the active um, dimension. So all the X, Z, and T dependence disappears into a, a wave number um, and a phase speed. Um, and in this system, there are two parameters. There's a, an epsilon, which physically is, is this, which is a combination of a vertical wave number, a shear, and something to do with the stratification and the rotation. But broadly speaking, we can think of this as being a non-dimensional shear. It's proportional to lambda squared, the shear. Um, and there's another parameter, k, which is a non-dimensional wave number which is just to do with the geometry of the waves um, or the disturbances in the x direction. So everything from here on is based on these three equations um, for u, v, and p, which are functions of y, which is the north-south direction. So you can think of y as being latitude, I guess. Um, now, when epsilon equals zero, so this is going to be the unperturbed system, there's a solution of these equations, which is um, very simple, which is a wave with u and p, both as the exponential of minus y squared over 2, v being 0 and the phase speed as being 1. So this is just a wave moving in the positive x direction at speed 1. And this is the, um, the famous Kelvin wave, although Kelvin didn't discover it, um, but it's called a Kelvin wave by some people. And that's the sort of the, the basis of the, 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 this, this talk. And what was discovered in this series of papers by Boyd, culminating in this paper from 2001, Nasrov and Boyd, is that when you um, set the shear to be non-zero, um, that this Kelvin wave becomes destabilized. So they found numerically that there's a mode um, where this phase speed C, the real part of it tends to one, which is the value for the, uh, for the Kelvin wave, and the imaginary part they suggested scales like the exponential of minus 1 over epsilon squared based on st their numerical results. Um, it's, it's also just worth noting that th there's nothing special about there being a mode with a positive CI. You can, um, you can also find modes with negative CI if you wish. The, the solutions occur in complex conjugate pairs, but we'll focus on these um, unstable modes in this talk. So what I'm going to do is just show you some numerical solutions of this um, set of equations. So it's just sort of revisiting the Nasrov and Boyd study. Um, and, th th you know, this is just a, fundamentally, it's a second-order ODE system in Y. So you can, you can find um, solutions easily by shooting. Um, and then you can iterate to find the um, eigenvalue C. And, of course, you can do this in a very um, sort of um, simple way. So th the simple way would just be, instead of um, solving on minus infinity to plus infinity, solve it on some large domain, maybe minus 10 to 10, where you set the um, eigenfunctions to be zero. You'd use a maybe a fourth order Runge cutter scheme or similar. You'd probably use a fairly small um, step in Y, and then you'd either use Newton or secant iteration um, for the uh, eigenvalues. And if you do that, this is the kind of thing um, that happens. So I'm showing you numerical results here for the real part of C and the imaginary part of C as epsilon is decreasing from 1 towards 0. So the Kelvin wave would sit at CR is 1 and CI is 0. And uh, if, you, if you do a sort of a, a simple naive scheme, then the, the real part of C is happily tending towards 1. And the imaginary part of C is going down at an alarming rate. So at epsilon equals 0.6, you're already down to an imaginary part of C of 0.002. And of course, this causes problems um, for your um, um, ODE solver because there are terms that are proportional to 1 over U minus C in the differential equation. 
So it's a simple numerics breakdown there, and you need something a bit more complicated. So uh, what people tend to do, and this is well, what people, a few of us tend to do, this is motivated by um, John Boyd and, uh, and his work with Andre Nasserov, is, is then instead of shooting along the real line, um, you shoot, and when you get close to this pole, which is coming down um, in the complex Y-plane um, from above, you just make a little deflection down um, into the complex plane um, to move around that. Um, to, to get really good results, you have to do a little bit more than that. Um, so um, th there's a, a, a series of tricks that I would use. First of all, all these solutions are decaying like e to the minus y squared over 2. And you really want to strip that off in your numerics if you're solving it on, on, on a wide domain. Um, otherwise, all the solutions are getting absolutely tiny as you, as you move away from the equator. Um, so we re remo I remove that sort of dominant behavior. And then to, to, to go down to smaller values of epsilon, we're going to need higher precision numerics. So the ones I'm going to show you are using um, a package in Python called MPMath. And typically, I'll be telling MPMath that I want to work to about 20 to 25 decimal places. OK, so it's going to be a shooting scheme, dipping into the complex plane at 20 to 25 decimal places, um, some um, secant iteration to find the eigenvalue C. And typically, this, this, this works. Um, in a few iterations, and on my laptop, which is from 2016, not very new, um, e each, each uh, iteration takes off the order of 20 to 30 seconds. Okay, so this isn't a big deal, basically, if you do it carefully. So these are some results then. So this is epsilon now, um, smaller values of epsilon, and I'm sh showing you log 10 of the growth rate, phi, and then it's now precipitously going down. So when you get down to epsilon at 0.15, the growth rate is 10 to the minus 22, right? So it's a very small growth rate. Um, if you were a real geophysical fluid dynamicist, you might be asking at this point, should we be interested in such a small growth rate? Does it have any physical relevance? But we're now in the epsilon part of the talk rather than the physical part of the talk, so I don't have to answer that question. Um, and, and, it, and it appears that there's some sort of... Um, uh, inverse power law behavior in, in here, in, in, in log of ci. And if you plot log of ci against 1 over epsilon squared, which is the behavior that Nasseroff and Boyd suggested, you get this reassuringly um, straight line. And you could fit a straight line um, maybe over here, where you have the straightest bit of the straight line. Uh, and this would give you this um, fit for ci. Um, which would be some small number times an exponential of minus 1.044 divided by epsilon squared. Right? Um, so this links back to John's talk yesterday morning about being careful uh, when you plot things on logarithmic scales because you, you might conclude that this is the asymptotic behavior. You might be worried that this number isn't closer to 1. Right? When I do numerics, I usually like to get things to at least two decimal places, <laughs> ideally three. 1.04 doesn't really look like 1 over epsilon squared, right? So you might take a leap of faith and say the underlying behavior is e to the minus 1 over epsilon squared, and then plot ci with that factor removed, which again is reminiscent of John's talk yesterday morning. Um, so we're now removing this exponential factor from ci and plotting what's left, and now you have something that looks like a, a positive power of epsilon that's left. And if you um, do a, a log-log fit of, of that behavior, you find um, this red line, which is 0.14 times epsilon cubed. Okay, so the proposed scaling for this um, uh, growth rate CI is this, 0.14 epsilon cubed e to the minus 1 over epsilon squared. Okay? So that's what we're going to try and derive. So yesterday, John, 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 when he showed similar things, had a, had a number that was 3.14 in his talk, and he said, it was going to be easy to see it was pi. So if you want to guess, have a game of guess the constant, you can try and work out what 0.14 is. Um, it's not pi minus 3. It's also not a seventh. So you can remove those from your considerations, but we'll find out what that is at the end of the talk. Um, the, the other thing I'll do is um, th there was a second parameter in the problem, which was k, which was a wave number. Those results I just showed you were at, at k equal or k tends to zero. Um, you, you can do the same sort of um, game of, of removing the epsilon cube dependence and the exponential dependence, and then doing a fit um, in, in some sort of polynomial fit 
um, of based on the numerics, and then you can derive what you think the leading order behavior is, which here I've called A naught. So A naught at k equals naught would be 0.14, and then you can do this at different values of this wave number k, and you find that this leading order constant changes with, with wave number, which is hardly surprising. Um, so, so the black crosses are the um, numerical results, and of course what we'd like to do is to get a something like this red dashed line um, to go through all of these. So we don't just want to get the number 0.14, we want to find how that 0.14 depends on k. Good, is that all fine? Splendid. So that's, a, that's the summary of the numerical results, but um, so this was all done by Natarov and Boyd. Well, a lot of this was done by Natarov and Boyd in 2001. Um, they proposed this um, scaling law and here we've refined it to this particular scaling law with this epsilon cube. So, again, numerically it's a bit of a pain because not only do you have the e to the minus one over epsilon squared, which is making things small, you've also got an epsilon cubed, which is just making it even worse um, for your numerics. Um, but what Natarov and Boyd couldn't do is actually derive um, any asymptotics for this system. They did spend a considerable amount of time studying this system, which they called a Hermit with pole system. So. When epsilon equals zero, it's just a, a parabolic cylinder equation or a Hermite differential equation. And then they, they stuck a pole in at y equals uh, minus one over epsilon. So it's a pole a long way away um, from the action. Um, and they, they did do asymptotics for this system and they found um, this, um, these asymptotics for the imaginary part of the eigenvalue, which did have this e to the minus one over epsilon squared scaling. So this is their studies in applied maths paper in 98. However, they, they, they realized that the method they were using would not readily generalize to the full fluid dynamics problem. Um, so we've had to use a, a pretty much completely different method to find CI for this full KW with Kelvin wave problem. And before we embark on the asymptotics, I will just note that I think people have done a, essentially a very sim similar thing um, in other bits of fluid dynamics. Um, so, for example, in a, in a paper by Reedinger and Gilbert in 2014, um, they found this is a, a complete, well, it's a fairly different fluid system. It's a shallow water system. They found um, what they called a critical layer mode where the imaginary part of C um, decayed like the exponential of minus some constant times K, and this was a large K expansion. So, again, it was an exponentially weak um, instability. Okay, so... Um, this then is part three, the third and final part, um, which is going to be the asymptotics. So um, there's just a couple of tricks at the start. So I, I, did, I did tell you at the start we were going to have U and V, the horizontal flow in the two directions, plus pressure. It turns out that it's, it's slightly more convenient to work not in terms of U and V, um, but there's some and their difference, which are going to be Q and R. So um, uh, U is going to be um, U plus P will be two times Q and uh, P minus U will be two times R. So we're going to work in terms of Q, R, and V. And the three equations I showed you at the start of part two become these three equations for Q, um, R, and V, which are all functions of Y, and D is just the, uh, going to be denoting the Y derivative. And we still have our two parameters, which are the epsilon, which is going to be small, and K, which is just going to be some order one constant. And if you wish, you can manipulate these three into a single differential equation for V, um, which is this. Again, this is sort of one that's a bit messy, unfortunately. And in particular, it's got a factor of 1 over C minus epsilon Y. And this is the term that kind of causes all the problems, because as C becomes small, um, there's going to be a pole on the real axis at, at Y equals C over epsilon. Okay. These terms actually don't cause any problems for uh, other reasons, but this is the key term. Um, and in these, in these equations, when epsilon equals zero, you have a Kelvin wave solution. And another, another nice feature of the QR system is that the Kelvin wave is, is Q equals one, and R equals V equals zero, and C equals one. So it's got a nice clear structure in the, in the QR variable. The other thing I should have said here is that we've stripped off the exponential, the dominant exponential dependence for this analysis. Okay, so all these waves decay away from the equator like e to the minus y squared over 2, um, and we strip that off at the start. So we just do the usual stuff to start with. We'll, 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 we'll first of all do an, uh, an analysis near the equator, so little y is going to be order 1, 
And we'll just perturb around this known Kelvin wave solution, uh, which only appears in the Q variable, and it's got the phase speed of one. <coughs> and I mean, it, it's fairly easy to do. You, you get expressions like this that come up for, 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 for the first perturbation for V, and you just want to make sure that all these things still honor the decay that you need as you go to plus and minus infinity. You've actually already got decay built in because we stripped off um, this e to the minus y squared over two. So all you need to make sure is that your solutions do not grow any faster than e to the minus y squared over two. So for example, in this first term for v1, as y goes to infinity, this would become a constant and you'd get growth like e to the minus y squared. So the first perturbation for phi would have to vanish. Right? And it, 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 it works out all very nicely. And this is the developing expansion for C, um, Q, R, and V. Okay. And the purposes of this are, one, to show you it's fairly simple, and two, that all this breaks down when epsilon times Y uh, becomes of order one, which you can see in uh, um, various terms. Okay. So we then have a, an outer expansion. So we have a, a new variable capital Y, which is epsilon times little y, and we'll treat this as being order one. Um, and it's, it's convenient now to go back to the full second order differential equation system. Um, and that's in part because the second derivative term disappears um, on this outer scale. And actually, as epsilon goes to zero, you end up with a fairly simple first order ODE um, involving uh, this term and a couple of terms from here, um, which has this solution. So it's got a behavior like one minus y to the half. Um, and you can match that to the inner by letting big Y go to zero, which sets the constant. So this is all fine. Um, but what's happening here, of course, is that I if V is going like one minus Y to the half, then the second derivative, which we'd neglected here, is gonna become large as uh, Y approaches one. And you can anticipate a breakdown in this solution when the second derivative term, which will scale like this, um, matches the first derivative term, which would scale like one minus y to the minus a half. So that's when y is one plus order epsilon squared. And capital Y equals one, this is the location of this um, critical layer or this pole in the differential equation or this near pole in the differential equation. So it's not really surprising this is coming out. So, so what we're kind of getting now as our structure is we've got that inner solution, which is the one I showed you a minute ago, the one near the equator, simple perturbation expansion. We're gonna have an outer expansion either side of that. And it actually turns out to be the same outer expansion whether you're here or here, because they both have to match to the same inner. So we've got these solutions here and here. Um, this capital E is just all this exponential stuff that I didn't want to write out again. Um, we're then gonna enter this um, critical layer region where something else is gonna happen. And then beyond the critical layer, we're going to have another region where Y, capital Y, is order one. And this will be a different outer solution that we've yet to um, work out. Okay, it's going to have the same structure as this, but there'll be a different constant because we need to match it into the critical layer rather than match it back to the inner. Okay, so we've basically got five zones in our solution, of which we've already solved for three, is the good news. So going into the critical layer, then we then introduce a, a critical layer coordinate, um, which is going to be mu. Um, it turns out it's best, it's, it's best to write this not as one plus um, epsilon squared times mu, but you need, you need the, 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 the first non-trivial correction to the phase speed to enter this as well. And then if you um, rescale that big second order differential equation for the, for the critical layer, the leading order terms give you this confluence hypergeometric equation for V as a function of the critical layer coordinate mu, um, which has these two standard solutions. Um, so one of these solutions um, grows exponentially as you exit the critical layer to the right, and that cannot match with the known outer solution over here, which doesn't have any exponential growth in it at all. So within the critical layer, your solution purely has to be some multiple of uh, this, uh, this part of the confluent hypergeometric solution. Okay. Um, and then we can match that back into the critical layer, uh, back into the, 
um, outer zone. So we can take the solution limit of this going into the critical layer and the limit of the, um, oops, of uh, this going back out. And you find that you can, um, the, 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 the well, there's, there's one subtlety in that the, the limiting behavior of, of, of capital U as mu goes to minus infinity is like mu to the half, and these becoming negatives. You just have to make a choice as to which branch you want to select for the square root. And this links back to something I, I said at the start, actually. You've basically got to make a choice as to whether you want to operate in the um, upper complex plane or the lower complex plane. So this links back to the numerics where you're either going to dip below the pole or go above the pole. Um, so there's, 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 a choice, there's a plus or minus choice you can make, plus for above the real axis and minus for below the axis at real axis, and both are relevant to the numerics. Um, so um, w once you've sorted it out, this is the, this is the solution um, in the critical layer with the uh, minus or plus. And then you can match that out um, to here and determine that constant that was unknown. And at that point, you've basically done everything it seems, because you've now got a solution um, in the inner, you've got a pair of outer solutions that you know, you've got a solution in the critical layer, which I just showed you, which I won't write out, and then you've got the solution in the outer, and it appears the problem is done, right? Um, so C2, so yeah, so C, well this is C2 here, actually. Oh. Yeah, it's the order of epsilon squared perturbation to the um, phase speed. Um, th of course, the problem is there's no imaginary part to C. And, and I mean, that really isn't a surprise because everything here has just been based on regular perturbation expansions in powers of epsilon. So we've, uh, we've developed a, a theory um, that if you compare it with the numerics, looks very good, but um, the eigenvalue C is real. Um, furthermore, the leading order eigenfunction is real um, all the way over here, and it actually transitions to be pure imaginary out here and in the critical layer, um, the eigenfunction is actually complex. It's got real and imaginary parts. So, it's, so there's a transition zone from real behavior for the eigenfunction to imaginary behavior. And you can actually probe that a little bit more by thinking about the asymptotics of this confluent hypergeometric function um, as mu goes to minus infinity. So that's exiting from the critical layer back into this outer. So um, this was the behavior I showed you before that um, the dominant asymptotic behavior is, a, is U has an imaginary part, which goes like mod U to the half, but it has actually got a, a real part, and the dominant part of that real part is like an E to the minus mu over mu to the half. And as mu goes to minus infinity, that term, of course, is becoming exponentially small, right? So it needn't enter into the matching we've done, but it's nevertheless there. So um, as you exit the critical layer, um, there's a, a real part to V, which is determined by this, which is matching to the outer here. But there's also an imaginary part of V, which is decaying exponentially and becoming tiny, right, exponentially small. So the question is, what's happening to this? Because it's, it's here, it's becoming exponentially small as you go to here. So the question is, can you track what is happening to this exponentially small part um, over here in the rest of the solution we developed? Right? Um, it's there, clearly, it's just very small. And further in doing that, will you be able to find the exponentially small part of C? That somehow, presumably, it's going to have to match up with this exponentially small part of V. And the answer to this is yes, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be um, setting off down this route. So we have to go back um, to the, uh, the start almost. So we'll go back to the first region we analyzed, which was that simple perturbation expansion, which I called the inner. And we'll just write down the equations for the real and imaginary parts of each of our variables, plus the real and imaginary parts of our eigenvalue. And without approximation, these are the equations that come up. So I've written these as basically equations for the real part of everything um, with some imaginary parts on the right-hand side, and then equations for the imaginary parts with some real parts on the right-hand side. And that should be a CR, and that should be a CR as well. And what we're anticipating is in this inner region that all these terms are going to be exponentially small. They're just yet to reveal themselves. So that means up here, all these terms will be exponentially small, and we could neglect them from the, um, the real part of the analysis. 
which we've already done. So the real part of the analysis stands um, in terms of the regular, regular perturbation expansion. And then um, all these expansions for these real parts, we can then stick over onto the right-hand side as terms that are forcing the imaginary um, components of the solution. So we can rewrite these terms as terms that are exponentially small because they've got a CI in them uh, multiplied by something that we know. Okay? So there's kind of an assumption here which is really motivated by the numerics that there's going to be an exponentially small CI going along with these exponentially small parts of the eigenfunction. So the leading order balance has to emerge from, um, once you throw a few terms away, the leading order balance has to emerge from this set of equations. And it's not really obvious what it has to be, but there's clearly a scaling here where all of these imaginary parts are just proportional to CI with no additional epsilon dependence. And if you track through the maths, you find that the imaginary part of V um, um, is, is this. So I've, I've imposed here that it's going to decay as Y goes to minus infinity. That's the direction where there's nothing dodgy going on. You just want everything to decay nicely. Um, but as y goes to plus infinity, this grows like e to the y squared. Okay, and that's good because we want something exponentially, exponentially growing to match to the um, imaginary part of v that's exponentially decaying in the critical layer. And you can work out what r and q are doing as well, if you want to. And they're also exponentially growing. So where are we now? So we've, um, we've just looked at this inner solution and we found an exponentially growing uh, imaginary part of the eigenfunction. A few minutes ago, we looked at the exponentially decaying part of the uh, imaginary part of the eigenfunction coming out of the critical layer. So all we have to do now is match them up in this outer region. And then hopefully something will emerge. Um, so you can, I mean, I don't think we want to get maybe bogged down in too many of the details, but you can, um, you can, in this outer region, you have to be just slightly careful because these solutions are growing exponentially, like e to the y squared, um, but you also want to uh, honor the dependence on this long coordinate y, which is capital Y. So you're looking really for a two-scale solution. And wh when you look at the, the, the behavior of these imaginary parts, vi, qi, and ri, um, they, they no longer become driven um, by the real parts of the eigenfunction. So the driving terms become exponentially small. And you, you, can, you can boil it down to a, a simpler set of ODEs for, for these imaginary parts. There's a little bit of messing around, of course, but it's all, it's all fine. And, and what comes out is that the imaginary part of V in this um, outer region has uh, this functional dependence. And you can match it to the inner. This is the solution emerging from the inner. And this is going to be your solution then in this outer region for the imaginary part of V. And all that remains to do then is to match it into the critical layer solution. So we have um, this behavior entering the critical layer from the left. So we just now rewrite our outer in terms of the critical layer coordinate nu. So this is the behavior of the outer entering the critical layer from the left. Uh, we already saw the behavior of the imaginary part of V exiting the critical layer from the left, which was this uh, determined by the confluent hypergeometric um, asymptotic. And you just match these up, and then what emerges is a prediction for CI. Okay? And that prediction is this. Um, and there's two possible values according to whether you're, uh, how you're choosing the branch of the confluent hypergeometric function, or alternatively, if you're working in the numerics in the upper or lower half plane. So there's a plus or minus. Um, and the, the epsilon dependence is epsilon cubed e to the minus 1 over epsilon squared, which is good, because that's what we saw from the numerics. Um, there's a K dependence, which is described by this. And if you were playing along the game of guess the constant, the 0.14 was 1 over 4 square root of pi, it turns out. So um, there we go. And um, just to revisit the numerics, this is the, the plot of the leading order coefficient that multiplies the, the scaling epsilon cubed e to the minus 1 over epsilon squared from the numerics. And these crosses were the numerically determined values of that. And then this uh, red line is the asymptotic prediction. Right? And the agreement is pretty good. So that's it. Um, um, that, that is the, the, the problem solved. Um, so, so just to sort of 
to run through um, the big story again. So Nasserov and Boyd had found this instability um, 20 years ago and proposed this scaling. Um, so we've done a couple of things here. The first of which is to do some um, high precision numerics just to revisit this and just point out that this isn't quite right. You need this extra factor of epsilon cubed out the front. And furthermore, we've um, got numerics for these uh, pre-factors. We then derive this um, asymptotic prediction. And this pre-factor um, matches up with the numerics very nicely. And the key point is that, um, it, well, it all comes down to what happens to this exponentially small part of this confluent hypergeometric function as you go to minus infinity and then linking that back through to the main solution um, in, the, in, the, in the wave core. Um, I mean, what, what's key to all of this, um, and this is sort of interesting about this problem, is that it should really generalize to other fluid systems. I mean, you can, once you've done it, you can kind of see what you need. You need some sort of wave that's going to decay exponentially. So the exponential decay of the wave away from some feature is fundamentally what gives you the um, exponential behavior in the growth rate. Right? So you need a wave. You also need a shear flow where that wave, the phase speed of that wave, is going to match the flow speed. Okay, so that's the, the 1 over u minus c term in the differential equations. And if you've got those two things in your system, it seems plausible that this sort of behavior will result. Okay, and that's essentially what happened in the Riedinger and Gilbert paper, and I think some earlier papers as well in, in slightly different systems. Um, but there are some subtleties there which I think link to the fluid dynamics literature in that it doesn't always seem that you automatically get an instability, but you can get an instability. So really the question is, what's the underlying physical mechanism of all this? Right? I mean, th th there's something to do with a wave interacting with a critical layer, and somehow these two things are interacting constructively to give you an instability. Um, and then the final thing to say is that Josh is going to talk this afternoon um, about this same problem, um, but um, treating it um, by thinking about Stokes lines in the complex plane. So do come and listen to Josh at 2.50. Okay, thank you. expansion. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting maybe to see if you would do a full uniform expansion there because then, then it would, wouldn't hold locally but it would hold in a much, much b bigger part of the y, little y range and mm -hmm. might even go directly to minus infinity. So okay. then you could connect maybe minus infinity plus infinity with one expansion. Okay, save, save, save some work. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but the, the, the only question is I don't know is whether it actually also would go through uh, the origin or not, whether it's valid till the origin or goes yeah. further. But yeah. that's one thing to, to try maybe at some point. Okay, but it's a, it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, with uh, C minus epsilon Y everywhere, I was wondering <laughs> if you thought of using C minus epsilon Y as a change of variable, uh, because that would put your eigenvalue in the numerator. Uh, because you have C minus epsilon Y and you do a asymptotic analysis in a complex Y domain, slightly mm -hmm. shifted mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. And you could perhaps recover a lot of these results uh, um, in, okay. you know, with in, a, in a different way. Uh, okay, yeah, sounds like an interesting um, yeah. thing, thing to... I actually had a question for the audience as well, Phil, which is, which is I mean, I mean, I mean we, we discovered this, this, this method um, you know, just by playing around. I mean, the other, the other question for the audience is, have you seen this sort of an a a analogous method to this in other problems? Right. You don't have to answer that now, but um, if you could tell me after the talk if you've basically met this procedure in other problems, I'd be quite interested to hear about that. Great, thank you for a very interesting talk. Let's uh, thank Stephen again. So our next objective